sound better. How do you sound? How does it sound to you, Joe? Great. You sound great. I was born Cleveland, Ohio. What year? Uh, in the year uh, uh, 1932. 1932, and your birth date was in September? 12 September, oh, 1932, then in the midst of the Depression. Right in the Depression days. <laughs> in fact, Roosevelt hadn't even been elected at that time. Two right. months later, he would right. be elected. And you lived in the southeastern portion of the city. What did your father do? For My father was a gas station manager. Oh, you remember what he station? Did, uh, well, he was with the Standard Oil Company, uh, and he was uh, a personal employee of John D. Rockefeller. Well, how about that? He was his mechanic at that time when he started Standard Oil. When he started Standard Oil. Yeah, and uh, so he was with him a number of years. Then. Oh yeah. And it yeah. was known as Esso then. Yeah, well, instead of Exxon, they had a heck of a history. We uh, everything we got, we got to a point. We got it, and it was it was told us and and it educated us to a point where teaching us. Responsibilities like a pair of shoes. You took care of the pair of shoes. You come home from school, you polish it up and pin, put it under your bed. When you got 12 kids, it's a lot of shoes, clothes and stuff. So you were going to pass them along too? <laughs> no, pass them along. Because wherever the individuals use their clothes. And uh, it was a situation like. Uh, you had personal, that was your personal. You, 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 cared, you cared for that, and you personally possessed it. What well, don't pass it along. I thought maybe the younger child got it then after you. No, they... You wore it out. Eventually. We wore it out. I mean, you don't know we're wearing shoes out when you get to the point where you have to put paper in the bottom of your shoes, and where you had to flap your soles would come loose and it'd be flapping. You, that's our education. You figure out ways to keep it from flapping. And at a certain time, you know how to cut it off and uh, walk on that paper that you was putting in your shoes. And uh, you learn real quick. I, I, I got to a point where you were the individual you tried to survive. I got my first job when I was nine years old. I was the ice man. Too many people know, know about ice. Ice man is the guy that put ice in your throat, your ice box, and you had to keep your food cold up before the the refrigerator was invented. So I, nine years old, I carried twenty five pound block of ice. I had ice tongs that swinging on my shoulder. And you go down the street and everybody had a car in their window. You turn a certain way for well, how much ice you want, 25, 50, or 100 pounds. And you, whenever you see that car in the window, you get, your, you get your wagon, get that block of ice, you had ice pick, and you had tongs, and you had a leather pad on your shoulder. You swing it on your shoulder and go upstairs and the ladies usually have to add all the food out of the ice box and uh, had ice box clear but never which never happened. They always got you standing there 
with that ice on your shoulder while they clean out their ice powder. <laughs> he put it in that water. That I like, see put paper down with the ice dripping. And you stood there and waited for her to clean it out, which looked like it was hours when you got ice on your shoulder. And you put that ice in there and they put the food back in around the ice. They had top opening ice boxes, they had front loading ice boxes. It amazes me today to see these refrigerators. <laughs> Because, hey, they don't know what's going on. Even our cooking stove, where our, our, our food was cooked on a stove, which is ice, which was coal and wood burning. It had eyes on the top. You had like four eyes, and you had, you had to put paper in there, and then you put wood in there. And you light it, and wood start burning. You put your coal in there. And uh, Mama come along and start cooking. That was the interesting days then. Did you also heat your irons on the stove? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Sand irons. Yeah. Those things, those days were the good old days. I remember those getting up. Everybody would be assigned a job. And when you had, when you had that morning where you had to start the fire in the kitchen stove, or start the fire in the dining room stove, or go down and get coal out of the basement, and bring it upstairs. Those things that kept kids out of trouble. <laughs> it's uh, at, at eating time. I had the biggest dining room table you ever seen in your life. Great big round table. And when you were sitting down, 12 kids at a table, it's crowded. When dinner time comes, or breakfast time comes around, you better be fast getting to that table. Because if you are late, you have not had nothing to eat. <laughs> Left leftovers. And hardly ever leftovers. That was really <laughs> back in those days. <laughs> among, among the 12 children, were you the oldest, youngest? No, I was the fourth. Fourth one. Fourth I was oldest. the fourth, yeah. Were you the first, uh, first of your brothers and sisters to go into the military? No, I was the second. Who went before you? My oldest brother. And what did he He do? went in special service. He played the trombone. <laughs> in the band. Was he in World War II or? World War, uh, at the, well, between World War between. II. Between. He, between that 46 and 44, that was when he went. And I went, actually, uh, due to the fact that those 12 kids, meal time got to be a thing where food was valuable and rare. You couldn't just sit there and say, give me some more. You had to eat what you had and go on. And what made me go in the military is uh, I wanted to eat regular. <laughs> <laughs> Your brother told you oh. he was eating, eating regular? Hey, they called, they used to say, three hops on a cot. And I, actually, I, I was 13 years old, and a bunch of guys and me, we went down to see if we could get draft cards. And we went down there and got draft cards. I was the littlest one, but uh, all the guys were bigger than me. I was the littlest one, 13 years old. And then we joined the National Guard. Five of us. How old were you when you joined the National Guard? Thirteen. Thirteen. <laughs> all five of us joined. And they threw all of the guys out. <laughs> it kept me. <laughs> <laughs> I never did understand that. 
They kept me because I got a job in the supply room. I could handle the supplies. And I also was taught how to drive a Jeep. So here yeah, I was, 13, 14 years old, driving a Jeep. <laughs> where, where was I you? used to drive that thing to school. In Cleveland? Yeah. I could wear my uniform. I was showing all the girls' thing, because I had a uniform. I wear the fatigues. I wear them to school. I would dress that and fatigues up. And we go to school. I went to, when I went, to, by the time I got to high school, I was really in there, because I stayed in there about three years. And uh, I got to be the, the, the sergeant's pet because I could do so much, I always tried to do more than they asked me to do. That made everybody like me, and I was able to do different things. And it, it was a real and different experience. Then I found out, hey, if you miss three meetings, if you miss three meetings, you were volunteered for the draft. And uh, what I did is miss three meetings. They sent my name into the draft board. And uh, next thing I know, I got a greeting. <laughs> For Mr. Truman. <laughs> <laughs> greetings, your friends and neighbors. A board consisting of your friends and neighbors have selected you for military service. And uh, I really didn't think they were going to take me, but they took me. Went down to the draft board, had my physical and everything, and I was continuously waiting for them to catch me. So I was about 16 years old then. I was continually waiting for them to call me out and call me on this 13 year old. And, 16 year old thing, but they didn't. Uh, and so uh, I finally, when I went down and got my physical, I passed my physical, I took the oath, ended up going to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Yeah, I was 16 years old then. I go to the Fort Knox, Kentucky, and have a previous service. By me having a previous service, I got to wear acting corporal stripes, acting PFC stripes at the time. And I, it was promoted to acting corporal. Uh, and instead of everybody else was walking up and down the hills, marching, I got the job driving a truck and a team. <laughs> they had two hills in Fort Knox. One was called Agony Hill, and the other one was called Misery Hill. <laughs> and uh, those guys marching, and I was, I, I had the job of taking their food out there to them and stuff like that, and doing all the odd jobs. So I got out of a whole lot of things. That they were going through. Was the army integrated at that time, Jim? No, in, my, in fact, no. I was all black then. It was black outfits and there were white outfits. And I didn't even know. Uh, the only white we had in our outfits were officers. I what taught me. I never had distinguished black and white, because all my friends were black and white, and Jewish and German, and uh, I didn't experience any of that things until I got to Fort Knox to Kentucky. When I got the train, I saw a sign say white only, black only, and uh, that's when I started experiencing. Now that scared me. I went to Fort Knox. I didn't come off that place. 
I didn't come off that base until I got my tipping orders. And then the new experience was we got on a plane on the way to Fort Worth, Texas, and this train segregated us. And we, when we stopped in certain places and everybody went to eat, they, didn't, they segregated us and made us eat in the office or in another separate room for the rest. It still was integrated. And I went to Fort Bliss, Texas. Suddenly, this integration came. And uh, they did some outfits, they dissolved, period. They deactivated and some outfits, they just integrated. And so that was a new experience too. There was, there was a lot of animosity developing because, oh yeah, because certain people, they, they were a certain way and they, this is a new way for them. And certain people can't adjust. Being, well, for some reason, I adjusted easy. And I got respect for some reason, because I didn't go with any man in my city. I fought, I had my, see I was, all my grandfathers, I, both my grandfathers were preachers. And I was raised with a certain moral. And this is that. They teach you, treat other people like you want to be treated. And it's easier to make friends than it is to make enemies. And it's good. It's a, I found that to be a good way to go. Because if I can't, it's like you, they teach you little things like if you can't say nothing good to a person, don't say nothing at all. Little things help you if you take them to heart. So, uh, that way I adjusted to the military and, then, and I earned respect. They had uh, white uh, people in charge of the mil of, uh, in military. These had classes. They call a class. They, they, I call it a uh, brainwashing. <laughs> they said that they try to teach us how to get along with each other. But they had the wrong ideas. They said the way they wanted you to be little, be little yourself instead of being arrogant or outstanding, you're supposed to stand back. But it didn't work for me. When the lieutenant told me that I'm from a certain environment and that's the way I'm going to be. And I questioned that. I said, an individual can be what he wants to be. He got mad at me, very upset. And uh, I found out that some people feel certain ways. I learned to deal with that and just stay away from these kind of people. And it was really, I've had guns pulled on me. Believe me, that was very good, that was the experience. I never thought I'd have. But I learned to survive it day by day. Do the best with every day you get. And get along with everybody you can. Find, find that by friendly, people grow together. Being unfriendly, people grow apart. And I, find, I, I say come to you, I ain't looking at your skill, I'm looking at your character. You know what I mean? I don't want negative people around me. And if I meet negative people, I'm gonna try to get to them and make them have a positive attitude. If I can't, I just don't deal with them. So uh, that was another experience. Now that being young, I'll tell you something, you don't develop your mind 
the mind really don't develop. All that time I heard about the Korean War, they were fighting and stuff. I was naive. I didn't believe it was really happening. I didn't believe there was really no war, people shooting and cutting each other. I didn't know there was really a war until I got off to, got, went on a troop trip with thousands of men were going to Korea and got to Korea. I didn't, I didn't believe there was fighting until I saw fire in the air and heard these guns. I, that's when I realized, hey, they're really fighting over here. Now, when was that? That was in uh, 1951, what around you, June. Do you remember the day that your unit got orders to move? Do you remember what it was like the day that oh, you second, was that when you said in the grade or what? No, to move to Korea. Oh, well, they they had individuals. They called names up. They called names off the roster. Some were going to uh, Europe. Some people were going to uh, Japan. Some people were going to the Far East Command, which was Korea. Uh, we kind of raised a little hectic because when I got in the line, I looked over there, it was all white. And I looked at my line, it was all black. I said, wait a minute. I talked it over with a, with a couple of guys. I said, man, they just another white guy to Europe. And uh, we questioned that. First they told us, they said, well, they're sending the blacks to Korea, not sending no more to Europe because uh, they're leaving too many black babies over there. Well, uh, we questioned that. The officer that. said that to you? Yeah. And uh, I never thought no more about it. But uh, from then on, it was plain, plain old integrated army. You did what you did. By that time, you were no longer a clerk, were you? You were you you had uh, changed your jobs. I was never a clerk. Well, when, you mean the National Guard, you were. Uh huh. And, but when you got into the army, what was your job? I was a, a, a military truck driver. Forty three forty five was my MOS, which is a light truck driver. That's what I. That's what my MOS was. They changed me to Fort uh, for Bliss, Texas. Mm -hmm. It was the tank driver, which was a heavy vehicle operating. It was the MOS. You, you were doing your basic training at Fort Bliss then? Yeah, the advanced training. Advanced training. Yeah. And that was in the tank? Yeah, that was in the tank. Which tank was it? Uh, at Fort Bliss was the M forty seven. And what tank did you? And what tank in Korea? M four Easy. <laughs> it was an old tank with four engines in it. it. Had lateral like this, and very big old wood pedals. I never ever get that big iron mass monster. The coldest, coldest vehicle in the army. Had two Ford engines. It was a nice tank. You can you can speed you learn how to speed tip. I was short and I could not reach the the uh, clutch pedal and the gas pedal at the same time. I this seat was uh, on the springs. When I raised up the seat was raised up. <laughs> Anyhow, the gear shift were way over here. And uh you get a certain gear. You, get, you always usually start off in second gear. The first gear was for the old, you know, like you know, pulling something heavy up, trying to pull the heel. But you second gear, and you pull the third gear, fourth gear. 
fifth gear, and over here, sixth gear. The wheel. That was a job. They, the way they taught me how to drive, they took me out with the M4. The M4 tank, he said, this is the first gear, the second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear. That's the clutch, that's the gas. Here's the ignition switch. And left me out there. He said, drive it back. You drive it back to camp. And I had to learn how to stay out there and learn. I'm telling you, when I first got this thing into second gear and went to get up on the, the clutch, they pushed me up on the clutch. And that tank raised up like It was a job. But I, I finally learned how to speed tip. You could get the gas a certain way and it's, you can tip it. And now speed tipping was the only way you can do that thing. And uh, I got to be pretty good at it. Which camp were you at? Camp Fort Bliss, Texas. No, no, when you were in Korea. Oh, camp. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I started out at Pusan. Did, did you get there when they were in the Pusan perimeter? Uh, yeah. So that was in 50 that you got there? Yeah, they got there. The Pusan, well, this is when they started to push back. Right. We started Pusan, I went to Tegu, Tejan, all the way to Kyongsan, Suwon, Seoul, Yongdong Po. That's the way it was going all the way up. Did you get as far as the reservoir or didn't you go that far? We went all the way to the 38th parallel. I was so scared. I told those guys that I ain't fighting nobody. They said, well, yeah, you got to be here. You got to kill or be killed. I said, no, I ain't. I said, I said, they could put me in jail. I said, I'd rather be alive in jail than be dead out here. <laughs> so they, oh, they laughed at me. And I was laying in my bunk one night, and three of them came in, and two of them sat on me. And they had a, a fifth of old crow, I mean old, old four roses. They started pouring, <laughs> pouring on me. <laughs> and I wouldn't eat that, I wasn't drinking that. I would open my mouth. They poured it all over me. But I had got enough in me where it got me woozy. They did that for four days to me, to make me drink liquor. I had never drank no liquor before in my life. But I got to a point where, I, where my defense was, I would, take, I would drink some liquor, but I gotta drink it with Coke. You give me some Coke in there, and I'll drink it. So I put enough Coke in there I got pretty well looped. <laughs> so he started getting me drunk. So I had pretty, after then, I kind of done away with the ignorance of what I call it. I really didn't realize why I was so scared. And uh, I pretty well was able to handle it. I used to live in a, a drunk world, as you used to say. Staying over there, I was high most of the time I was there. I used to lay on the ground and look at the sky. And I imagined that when I look back, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see a neon signs, and stop lights, and red lights, and all, blue lights and stuff, you know what I mean? Like in the city. I was up on top of a mountain Looking up at the sky, and that was a, that was a nice time. Because you go into an imaginary world. And that's the way I got out of it. You remember, you remember the first time you realized somebody was shooting at you? Oh, we used to have attacks, you know, guerrillas. Attack our company area. 
and we used to lay back in my bunker, and I would have a square of the sky up there. And I had a forty-five caliber submachine gun. And anything came within that square of light, I'm shooting. They all lay in there in the hole one night, and something came in front of my hole. I saw a shadow, I fired at him, and this Chinese fell in there on top of me. And when he fell on top of me, he had his weapon with a Chinese bayonet on it. He stuck me in the side. And when he's on top of me, I thought he was alive. And me and him wrestled. We were rattling in that hole. And I swore he was with him. <laughs> The man was dead when I got I, I fought with a dead man for about an hour. I thought he was winning. <laughs> he I thought got, he was winning. <laughs> I can laugh now, but that was, hey, I urinated in my pants. I did everything. I'm telling you, I thought I was in the last moment of my life. But that happened. And that's probably like a lab but now. It wasn't so funny then. I always got hurt out of the tank, not in the tank. I was, I was always got hurt doing something I ain't got no business doing. You understand? Yes. Going out there, going across the MLR, going to visit the girls. Stuff like that, I end up like I, I and five more guys out. We, we went across the MLR on our way back. We were ambushed, and uh, we taught that when you when when a, a flare goes up, if you freeze, you won't be seen. And I hollered, freeze, when I saw this flare go up and they light up the whole area. Guys took off running. I took off running. And I heard the shell when it hit, and she heard it, boom, the ring. I didn't know where I was running, but I took off fast. And had a concussion from that shell, picked me up and threw me about 19 feet. I ended up on a riverbed, and I, boy, cold water didn't mean nothing. I come kind of way, I never did them lived see them other guys, but I made it back to camp. And uh, I was sitting there by the fire trying to dry off. Somebody said, Bishop, what's wrong with your leg? Nothing on my leg. And look there, oh my goodness, that blood. I see a pile of shrapnel, shrapnel had a piece of shrapnel this big that went through my boot, got me in the back of the leg. And uh, it was sticking out of the boot, really. Some kind of way I was trying to pull it out, didn't I? We took a knife and cut the rays, cut the strings on the combat boot. That outfit boot was full of blood. And uh, they called a helicopter. Helicopter put me on the stretcher. I started getting dizzy, you know. I had lost a lot of blood. Put in a helicopter. I remember being on the helicopter. I went to sleep, woke up. And they covered me with this shell thing, plastic. And I was on the wing. I on the, the not on the wing, but on the landing gear, the, the uh, helicopter, right. yeah. Right. The, the, the little stretch on the Yeah, and, uh, and I woke up again. I went to sleep again, I woke up, and I was in the hospital. <laughs> I was laying on the stomach. 
And this guy was, the first thing I heard was something ringing. And that was a piece of, pulling a piece of metal out of my butt. <laughs> I had 19 pieces of metal. <laughs> I didn't even feel it. Except when he pulled it out. Well, that was my first experience of getting wounded. And uh, I stayed up in there. Now, you know, it was something weird. It wasn't recorded on my medical records. I could show you scars, but they didn't even bother reporting. And uh, when the, I thought I was going home, because everybody was going home after they get hurt, I was, what it, oh, they told me that I was replacing myself. I'm a replacement for my own self. They explained to me that they, they were the shortage of tank drivers. So I ended up going back to Korea, back to the same outfit. And uh, it went on like that. You said, the, you said that was the first time you were injured. There were other times? Oh, I had four times altogether. But, uh, I did it all, all minor. In other words, it wasn't nothing to handicap me or anything like that. Most of them, I healed myself. Really? Yeah. Could you tell me about that? Well. The, the other times? Some of the times I heal, I heal good. All I do is keep it bandaged and clean. And they healed themselves up. Then about three weeks, something like that. And uh, it wasn't nothing that stopped me from walking or stopped me from, from moving around. And uh, I think I was pretty lucky. At that time, being that young, that was trivial to me. What about the DSM? What, for what did you get that? That uh, Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, the single service medal we got it, it wasn't formally, it wasn't done formal or anything like that. It just appeared on my records. And uh, I never thought of no tips here. I got too ready to ask me, what, what service medal did you got? That's when I found I had medals. I didn't even know. I didn't know I had them. So, uh, I had a couple of officers that liked me pretty good. Like I got promoted without no ceremony. I went over there as corporal, uh, acting corporal. I came back SFC, Sergeant First Class, E6. At that time it was the E6. But uh, I came back. Well, they did heal. And, uh, Let's see, when I got hurt last time. I think I was writing a letter on the outside of the tank, leaning against the tank, tank threads. And I was writing a letter. And a guy jumped me. He come from nowhere, he jumped on me. And me and him had it. I had a 45 caliber pistol. See, in the tank, we had a, a shoulder holster. We had 40 cal, 45 caliber submachine gun. Some kind of way, I was with this guy and I got the pistol and I shot him. And uh, that was the last time. Got some scratches on that one. Did you ever drive your tank into on an attack? Oh, we were we were going through the outfit, going through the what they call the punishable in Korea, and uh, they attacked the convoy. Just happened, I was on the first tank, so they let me through. They attacked the rest of them. But that's about the best fight, fire firefight that I saw. We lost about eight tanks in that. 
what I got through there on the trash. You told, you told us about something that happened to you and your unit uh, when you were moved out from uh, from Fort Carson to the Mojave. You remember that? Oh, that, you're talking about the atomic bomb exploding. That was in Fort Carson, where it stays between that between that uh, ski experience and the Fort Carson station. That was the day coming one morning. Orders came through for us to, what would they call it, load up anyhow. We had to move out. And, uh, they had made arrangements. They had a train waiting to take the tanks. And, uh, Went to uh, outside so San Bernardino, you know parts uh, about so yeah, and uh, we went over there. Then we got our tanks back and we cleaned up our tanks, and everything. And we went up to uh, what do you call it? some kind of point, and uh, we were told to uh, park the tank. Facing this way, they came through and they passed out dark glasses and the yellow badges. And uh, I know some of them, they wouldn't tell me, well, that, that disturbed me. They wouldn't directly tell us what they're going to do. And I went to put those pair of glasses on, they had that big explosion. I could tell, you know, the sky lit up everything. But then they were told, had, sitting there waiting and waiting, they told us to take our tanks and move them to this uh, other line. Uh, we moved up uh, about two, three miles up to this line, and uh, we told us to sit there. Till we were told to move again. Then uh, we, we drove back to that uh, that point that we were in there. They collected the badges. That's when I found out the badges that was, was yellow. They gave it to me. It was black now. <laughs> what, 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 what did everybody do when the explosion went? Was it, was it a surprise? Yeah, well, the word started getting around of the atomic bomb was exploding. The ground shook and everything. I mean, it was room. Was there, was there a big blast? It was like a, a, a large earthquake. I never did see no big Cloud, uh, Did you ever feel any concussion from it at all? Uh, the blast itself. Big wind. Wind, yeah. yeah. It had a big wind. Was it at night or in the daytime? At night. At night. Did they ever explain to you what what, what they were, what they were doing? They told us later that they had a they took a they had set up a bomb bomb explosion, and they wanted to see how soon. They could move troops in after the explosion, and to see what what amount of radiation we could, we did. Did they do any follow up to find out radiation effects with you? Mine, I just had I I, I just happened to uh, wrote to this atomic bomb veterans, and they put gave me a physical. And uh, I started naming up things. I said, well, five years after that, I said, I lost my teeth, all my teeth. I said, I got asthma. Nobody in my family have asthma. I said, I don't have any kids, and my family are large kids family, 
All of them have large, but I don't have one. But right after the experiment, they didn't. There wasn't any follow up with no, you know, no, these people. No. At that time, I tell you, the army did they did kind of haphazard, even records and so on and so forth like that. There was a lot. There was a lot of weird things going on at that time. There was a lot of things going on that I I questioned myself because I, I questioned my activities alone. I said now. Nah. Ordinarily, in my mind, said now, I would have never done the things that I did. It's not extraordinary for me. Maybe called the liquor and stuff I was drinking. But I tell you what, I uh, we smoked marijuana, everything. But uh, I had to have the, uh, smoking something every day. But the minute I got back to the United States. I didn't have no boys to smoke any dope or, or get, well, I did do a lot of the alcohol drinking until night in uh, September 1955. And uh, I went on a three day drunk. And I said, Lord, if you let me get over this, I'll never do it again. And today is was it twenty oh three? Yes. And I no alcohol. Well before I had to have the taste of whiskey in my mouth at all the time. It's just like chewing gum. When the sweetness is going out of the gum, you need another. That's the way I was. I've re-enlisted for six more years with the stipulation that I go to Europe. And now, I, I, they took, they gave me a $3,600 re-enlistment bonus, and I got a 30-day leave. And I went home, had a wonderful time. And uh, my next orders were to go to Fort Dix, Kentucky. I mean, Fort Dix, New Jersey. I had to go to Europe, and I uh, went there and processed and everything. And uh, suddenly, the people don't understand. See, after the Korean War, they had a, a, a what do you call it? An, a, an, a, an abundance of, of uh, soldiers. So they released them for no reason whatsoever. They come and told me that uh, I didn't meet a certain category. So uh, they had uh, also they had let me reenlist without waiver and disability. So uh, they told me well, I had uh, the option of staying in the army. Take an immediate discharge or stay in the Army to April 23rd and go for a board. And uh, I said, Well, I don't I do I have to pay back the re-enlistment re -enlistment bonus? He said, No, you got that. I said, Well, I'll go home. <laughs> so I'm going to have 14 minutes left on this day. This was in, in March of 55. Yeah, yeah, March of 1955. So you you got out on the discharge for the convenience of the government. That's right. That's exactly what it was. Right. Yeah. Convenience and of the government. It got yeah. an honorable discharge, though. Were Were you able to use any of the GI Bill rights at that time? Yeah, I bought a house in California. It came in mighty handy. No problem there. To me, it was survival. And uh, when you really get down to it, you think of your life, the people back home, and the way you were raised, and the opportunity you had back home. 
And if you, it's anything that the average soldier fights for, it's for the freedom to be what he was back home. And now, uh, the freedom to say things and do things. And now, uh, the military experience to me is the greatest experience I ever had. I don't think I would have ever had it. And I thank God I was able to have it. I, was, I, I hope it never had to get to a point where our body had to go to war. But I'm definitely against fighting for what you, what you believe in. Fight for what you have. And uh, look out for your fellow man. Jim, thank you so much for giving us this interview. And thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, it really was.